This is Chapter 24, Management of Patients with Chronic Pulmonary Disease, or COPD. We're going to be discussing um, some characteristics of COPD, what it means, and um, management strategies. So our objectives for the day, describe the pathophysiology of COPD, risk factors for the development of COPD, and how um, we as nurses can intervene to minimize these risks. Uh, describe nursing management of these patients, describe the pathophysiology of asthma, discuss medications used in the management of asthma, uh, asthma, asthma self-management strategies, and the pathophysiology related to cystic fibrosis. COPD is a preventable and treatable disorder that is characterized by airflow limitations. Um, these, this airflow, this limitation in airflow is not reversible, um, and it also is uh, it's a combination of airflow limitation and inflammation in the lungs. So COPD, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, is what COPD stands for. But it is it is characterized by limited airflow, limitations in airflow along with an abnormal inflammatory response. So it is an inclusive or an umbrella term that includes all causes of airflow obstruction, which can be emphysema and chronic bronchitis, or a combination of both of these. Used to, um, they would classify asthma along with this and put it in the category of COPD, but now asthma is considers it its own separate disease process and it is treated a little differently and it has different outcomes. So pathophysiology, the mechanism behind it, airflow limitation that is progressive in nature, it is um, again associated with this abnormal inflammatory response as the result of some sort of triggering agent. And that triggering agent can be lots of different things, OK? Um, it can be environmental allergies. It can be pollutants. It can be cigarette smoke. It can be um, medication related. I mean, there's just a lot of different things that can trigger this uh, airway constriction or airway limitation along with that inflammatory response. Ultimately, what we see is um, chronic inflammation that just, you know, chronic over time doesn't go away. It results in very narrowed and thickened airways with increased mucus production. Okay? So, this inflammatory response, it actually eventually changes the pulmonary vasculature. It causes what's known as remodeling of the lung structures or the lung tissues. The, the lung, it's like remodeling your house. You change it, well, the lung structures actually change over time. Um, scar tissue is formed. The airway, airways, again, become very narrow and and thickened from all the chronic inflammation. Um, eventually, and this is over years of time, this is not something that happens you know, in a few months or even one or two years. We're talking 10, 15, 20 years of being in a condition like this with chronic inflammation and um, chronic airflow limitation, as those airways actually change over and become uh, more scar tissue in nature and get thick, the vessels will hypertrophy and eventually it leads to pulmonary hypertension. It actually changes the vasculature inside the lungs and it makes the lungs very stiff. It makes those vessels hypertrophied or, or very stiff and rigid, and that leads to increased pulmonary pressures, 
or pulmonary hypertension that we have already talked about. Chronic bronchitis is the first um, disease process or the first part of COPD we're going to talk about. It is characterized by um, a cough with sputum production for at least three months in at least two consecutive years. So this is a person, it's not just that you get bronchitis and you get over it. This is somebody who has bronchitis for at least three months or more and they get it every year, you know, for at least two years or more. So, you know, this is a condition that doesn't go away easily. It doesn't resolve easily. And even when it does resolve, it's, it's prone to come back. Many times chronic bronchitis is seasonal, especially here in Louisiana. Our big triggers for allergy season are fall and spring. Ragweed is a big, big trigger here in this area. And so we will see our patients, our um, COPD patients, we'll see them come in, be admitted very frequently in the very late fall, right after the first cold snap. And then a lot of times in the spring when everything starts blooming again, we'll see them uh, get a flare up of this chronic bronchitis. The irritation or those triggers um, cause the airways to become inflamed, hypersecretion of mucus. Um, over time, the ciliary mechanisms inside the lungs deteriorate, especially if that person is a smoker. Uh, we know that cigarette smoking will actually kill the little cilia, so that function can be greatly reduced. And um, again, the bronch the bronchioles, those walls thicken, they hypertrophy, and as they thicken, it causes the actual diameter to become narrow so that air has less, less physical space to move in and out of. And because there is increased mucus and decreased ciliary function, it's not uncommon for them to experience mucus plugs. That's a narrow airway with more secretions that we cannot get rid of. And so these patients are prone to developing mucus plugs in their airways. Over time, with chronic bronchitis, the alveoli are damaged. They become fibrotic. They um, lose their ability, that self-protective macrophage function, the you know, macrophages that fight off all the, the bad stuff that cause infection. That, that protective ma macrophage function is, uh, deteriorates, and so those alveoli become fibrosed, and actually um, the patient becomes more susceptible to respiratory infections because they have lost that protective uh, macrophage function. Here's a good picture of the changes in the airways um, on the left, you see this normal airway, nice and open, a good diameter for air to move in and out of. And then over here on the right, you see how the inflammation has caused all of this to become very thick and closed off. And then you throw in some good mucus in there to block you know, what little bit of airway is open, you see the change in diameter. So if there is an over secretion of mucus or a buildup of mucus that the patient does not clear effectively with coughing, it will actually obstruct that whole little airway there. All right, emphysema, the next one we're going to talk about um, is different than chronic bronchitis. Emphysema develops more slowly. It is um, characterized by abnormal dis distension of the alveoli um, with destruction of the walls of the alveoli. So what happens is the, the little air sacs, those little alveoli, actually overinflate. 
and they the the walls that separate those individual alveoli or they deteriorate and so it just becomes one giant big air sac because of the decreased surface area uh, inside these alveoli or between the alveoli it actually creates what's called a dead space so it's instead of being all these individual little air sacs that have really good perfusion we have this one big air sac that actually has a bunch of what we call dead space it means it can't perfuse um, the oxygen can't diffuse in and the CO2 can't diffuse out the way it's supposed to and so it just creates this little environment of uh, perfusion mismatch that's the alveolar dead space there is a reduction of um, the pulmonary capillary bed so again perfusion deteriorates pulmonary vascular resistance and pulmonary artery pressures increase because of the lack of perfusion and the in the reduction of that capillary bed it, it causes physiologic changes inside the lungs and it actually causes the lung pressures to increase and um, it, it will elevate the pulmonary vascular resistance so again this happens over time 10, 15, 20 years. It's not something that develops overnight. Ultimately, when all of these changes take place and the dead space develops, then the patient develops hypoxemia. And then even further, as that as these changes you know progress, even after the hypoxemia begins to develop, those increased PA pressures will eventually lead to right-sided heart failure. Um, if you remember when we talked about the PA catheter, how we measure the pulmonary artery pressures, um, it's, it indicates right ventricular, the, the pressure that the, the right ventricle is generating. So with elevated pulmonary artery pressures, it can lead to right-sided heart failure. Eventually, um, there will be just an absence of gas exchange in that dead space. And it causes, like I said, that hypoxemia, but it also causes retention of CO2. Um, it also leads to increased pulmonary vascular resistance to pulmonary blood flow, eventually right-sided heart failure. So you need to be looking for signs and symptoms of right-sided heart failure. Here's a good picture of what I was talking about. Over here, we've got our nice little air sacs and their individual little alveoli that are separated by their own alveolar walls. You know, each little individual sac. Okay, and then you, you can see here they're beginning to be overinflated, um, in in these terms, central lobular emphysema. I'm not really, you know, we're not going to focus on these specific types, specific terms. What I want you to see here is that these are beginning to be overinflated. Okay, we get a little overinflation, a little distension in these um, end bronchioles and then over here in this one you can tell that there is a loss of the individual wall between these air sacs and it just really becomes one large air sac okay but because we've lost these walls the capillary bed is in these walls and as the capillary bed is destroyed we lose the ability to perfuse to have oxygen in and co2 out and so what happens is that the CO2 just sits there. It doesn't get removed the way it should. And oxygen doesn't come in. So this little air sac, this little bleb right here, actually just becomes a reservoir for CO2. 
and so your patient becomes a retainer of CO2. We also see some changes in the chest wall and the physical characteristics of the patient. Um, they, because of these overinflated alveoli or enlarged bleb like alveoli, we see this um, change from normal chest excursion, normal chest shape, AP diameter, which, you know, if you remember back to um, health assessment, your AP diameter, the anterior posterior diameter should be half of your transverse. So anterior, well, anterior posterior should be half of shoulder to shoulder. It should be wider from shoulder to shoulder than you are front to back. Well, in your emphysema patients, you're going to see that AP diameter um, double. So they actually will be twice the size from front to back as they are from shoulder to shoulder. So they get this nice round barrel chest. This is what we call that barrel chest of COPD. Of course, risk factors for COPD are um, smoking. Uh, tobacco smoke is, you know, they say 80 to 90 percent of all cases of COPD are related to cigarette smoke, either um, primary smoker or passive inhalation. Uh, pa um, they also say now that women, or not just women, but significant others of smokers have as much or more risk of developing COPD as the smoker themselves because they also are inhaling all of the smoke. So passive smoking is a very great risk also. Tobacco smoke in either case, primary or, or passive, damages the cilia. So it, it really deteriorates and destroys that cleansing mechanism of the lungs to help remove mucus and um, allergens and things of that nature. So, you know, it's not just that it is a noxious trigger for mucus production or that it causes remodeling of the airway, but it actually damages the body's own inherent ability to fight infection. Occupational exposure, um, that can be things like asbestos exposure, uh, paint fumes, dust, uh, sawdust, um, you know, any powders or pollutants, air pollutants, um, anything that, you know, is breathed in or, you know, occupational exposure would be as, as a result of a workplace, you know, job related. Um, can be carbon monoxide exposure. Typically carbon monoxide, um, the byproduct of that combines with hemoglobin and it leads to carboxyhemoglobin, which is a very, very significant lung uh, pollutant or, uh, you know, it, it it prevents the body's ability to carry oxygen. In carboxyhemoglobin, the CO molecule, carbon monoxide, binds to the hemoglobin instead of oxygen binding to hemoglobin. And so the patient cannot, that hemoglobin molecule cannot carry oxygen. So the patient actually becomes hypoxic. Um, you see that a lot with fire, smoke inhalation, you know, exposures of that nature. Uh, of course, ambient air pollution, smog, you know, things like that, anything that's inhaled. And then another risk factor for COPD is the alpha antitrypsin uh, enzyme deficiency. Uh, alpha antitrypsin is an enzyme inhibitor. It protects the lungs, uh, the lung parenchyma. And people who are deficient in this um, 
alpha antitrypsin, it predisposes them to rapid development of emphysema. So they, they're just born, they're just genetically without this protective mechanism. Very rare, but in cases of a patient that develops COPD, and they are not a smoker, never have been, they've never been around anybody who was a smoker, they have no occupational or environmental exposure, then we have to test them for the genetic abnormality. This is why it's so important for you um, when you are talking to your patients, when you're assessing them, you ask them, are they a smoker? If they say no, I, I say, do you smoke? No. Have you ever? And if they say yes, then I want to know, okay, when you did smoke, how much did you smoke and how many years total from start to finish? It doesn't really matter if they smoked, you know, a period of time was a half a pack and then the, another period was two packs or, you know, it really doesn't matter how much. I just like to know the total amount of time that they were smoking and how many, at most, how many packs a day. Um, because that really will tell you their, their risk factor for COPD. Someone who says to me, well, I quit a year ago, that's awesome. Good for you. When you did smoke before you quit, how many, how many packs a day were you smoking and for how many years? Well, if they tell me they were a pack a day for 15 years, and then even though they've been quit for a year, I know they still have a potential to have symptoms of COPD. And that really, really factors in when you're doing your assessment in terms of anticipating problems that they might have. So assessment criteria, thorough health history, physical assessment findings. Review the chart on page 606. Smoking, cigarette smoking, and then their um, occupational or environmental exposures. It's very important to assess all of those. Look at their lungs, their physical characteristics, the chest um, size, AP diameter, lung sounds, their positioning, are they tripoding? Um, do they do they try to get you know in that position of comfort? The thing about emphysema, COPD, is that they have uh, with those overinflated air sacs. Remember, I told you it's a reservoir for CO2. The patient has an extremely hard time exhaling. Exhalation is supposed to be passive. That breathing out CO2 is supposed to be a passive process that does not burn any energy. In patients with COPD, they have to really work to get the air out of those air sacs because it becomes trapped in that dead space. So they will often have be air trappers is what we refer to them as. That's why they get barrel chested because they have um, you know, that overinflated alveoli with all that trapped CO2 in there. So looking at their physical characteristics, looking at their respiratory pattern, looking at their expiratory pattern, are they really working? Are they using physical effort to exhale? And along with that physical effort, you know, instead of being a passive process, they're having to expend energy. So not only will they be barrel chested, but a lot of times they will be very, very thin because they are burning twice the calories that a normal person would burn just in respiration. They're, they're burning calories on inhalation and exhalation. Um, a lot of times, you know, that IE ratio, the inspiration should be um, half of expiration. You know, it, it, our, our expiratory cycle is twice as long as our inspiratory cycle normally. Well, these patients will have a pro, even prolonged expiratory phase because they're having to work to get the air out, okay? So it's just their physical 
physical stature, their, your physical assessment, and their history is very important here. We can also do um, PFTs, pulmonary function testing. Uh, it's a really good diagnostic test in, in spirometry to measure the amount of airflow obstruction that's there. Uh, the PFTs can tell us whether or not the damage is permanent, okay? Um, also with PFTs, if you'll go back um, in, to last semester when y'all talked about PFTs, part of the, the pulmonary function test is to measure airflow and then give them a breathing treatment with a bronchodilator and then measure airflow again. And so if they respond well to the bronchodilator, if the condition is reversible after administration of a bronchodilator, then that's a good thing. That tells us that the patient can be treated a little more easily than someone who does not respond or has a minimal response to bronchodilators. Of course, ABGs are very useful to tell us the um, acid-base balance and the arterial oxygenation. Um, also, they're going to be used to tell us about arterial CO2 levels, whether or not the patient is a retainer, and maybe on their way to developing chronic acidosis. Chest x-ray, CT scan, both can be used to evaluate um, the diameter, AP diameter of the chest, looking for structural change, and also internal structural changes of the bronchi and the alveoli. Medical management is primarily aimed at prevention, risk reduction. Okay, um, we've got to educate. We've got to. Um, teach people about cigarette smoking and how to reduce their risk, how to limit exposure, environmental pollutants, occupational pollutants. You know, we've really got to, to focus on risk reduction. It's never too late to stop smoking. Pharmacologic. Uh, management, nicotine replacement, first-line pharmacologic therapy that's very reliable. Smoking cessation is the single most effective treatment or single most effective intervention uh, to reduce the risk of development of COPD. So nicotine replacement, you know, nicotine patches, gum, Chantix, whatever it takes to get these people to stop smoking. And then other pharmacologic therapies that are going to be used to treat COPD, bronchodilators, corticosteroids, oxygen. Um, there are other medications, um, allergy medicines, those um, things like um, Allegra and Claritin mast cell inhibitors, um, Singulair, you know, anything to help control the triggers, okay? So if allergies are a problem, then we really want to try to, to control that allergy trigger so that they don't experience an exacerbation of this chronic situation. The bronchodilators, of course, are going to stop bronchospasm. They're going to relax the smooth muscle in the lungs. There are short-acting bronchodilators and long-acting bronchodilators. There are now combination inhalers that have um, bronchodilators and steroids um, in them, the combo drugs that help to reduce the inflammation and cause bronchodilation. So there's a lot of combination medicines out there. For oxygen therapy, our goal is to increase the PaO2 to at least 60, keep our SATs at at least 90. Um, they can be on long-term oxygen therapy. 
um, you know, at home. It can improve quality of life. It can help to reduce or prevent uh, increase of pulmonary artery pressures. Long-term oxygen therapy can um, reduce dyspnea, improve patient quality of life, and improve survival rates. So, um, you know, oxygen therapy, home oxygen therapy, long-term oxygen therapy is very common today. It's not unusual to see people walking around with their little oxygen tanks, you know, with them. Um, they need to be educated on activity and how to balance activity with rest. They need to be um, educated on things like exercise-induced hypoxemia. Uh, because they can get hypoxic and a low oxygen level with activity, so they need to, to pace their activities and, you know, balance that out with rest. They need to be taught, taught home oxygen safety, uh, flammability issues, um, certainly not to smoke when they're on oxygen. They need to know maintenance of the tanks, when to change out their tank, you know, just basic information like that. Surgical intervention, um, two different procedures that we're going to talk about. A bullectomy is just where they go in and they actually resect those overinflated um, alveoli, that actual one big air sac. They'll go in and resect um, thoracotomy, and they'll remove just that area that's that's damaged. Um, it's not got good perfusion anyway, and so to remove it is not really going to hurt the patient. Um, so a bullectomy is just used to um, resect those overinflated airways. Uh, transplant is going to be used for end-stage emphysema patients that just, you know, that, there's so much of their tissue that is affected that resection is really not um, an option for them. So lung transplant is really the only option for them to improve their quality of life. But of course that is limited by available donors. Um, it's an expensive procedure. It is um, something that really requires long-term investment and um, really change in lifestyle because they have to be on anti-rejection meds. And, um, you know, transplant is, is a really big deal. It's an option, and it can give them a better quality of life, but it's a very involved. Pulmonary rehab is um, something that can be used to really help alleviate the patient's symptoms and improve their quality of life. It, um, it, in recent years, pulmonary rehab has really become popular just like cardiac rehab has uh, for heart patients. And we, we use it to help the people with chronic lung disease really improve their functional status and their, their be able to maintain a good quality of life be able to participate in their ADLs and, um, you know, just live with their chronic condition. Of course, patient education is always essential first and foremost. Teaching them about the disease process, the symptoms, those three classic symptoms of COPD, chronic cough, increased sputum production, and dyspnea with exertion. Those are those three classic symptoms that um, all patients with COPD experience. And so teaching them to expect that, to expect that chronic cough, to expect shortness of breath with activity um, and, and mucus and how they're going to, you know, how they need to handle those things. Teaching them about the medications um, that they're taking, how to take an, an inhaler, a handheld puffer, Y'all need to go back and review that, how you would teach a patient to use a handheld uh, inhaler correctly. We've got to be able to educate them correctly on that. Teaching them the differences between 
long-acting medications and their short-acting or rescue medications. You know, some of those short-acting bronchodilators are what we call rescue inhalers. Those are for acute episodes of bronchoconstriction. Uh, we definitely would not want them to use a long-acting medication in an acute episode of bronchoconstriction. So teaching them the difference between those. Home oxygen, we've talked about already, safety um, considerations for that. Pulmonary rehab will work with that patient on breathing exercises and breathing retraining using the pursed lip method to slow down their expiration and control that respiratory rate, that respiratory pattern. It helps the patient to relax and, um, and breathe easier. A lot of times with our COPD patients, they, when they have all that air trapping, they cannot exhale the way they need to. Um, it makes them very anxious. They know that their their breathing is off, and they 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 just can't get a good deep breath. A lot of times they feel like they're smothering, and it it's very anxiety producing for them. So many many of chronic COPD patients will be very anxious in nature. So breathing retraining really helps them learn how to slow down their respiratory pattern and help them relax so that they have very efficient respiratory cycle instead of that um, struggle to get air in and out. Activity pacing, um, teaching them to balance, you know, rest and activity. The patient, pulmonary rehab is really good about helping the patient learn their limits helping them realize what they can do or how long they can they can do an activity before they need to stop and they and teaching them how to to stop before they get so profoundly short of breath they work with them on self care uh, home care activity levels and uh, functional patterns you know just basic ADLs um, and then Again, oxygen therapy, they do spend time teaching them about safety and flow rates and how to check the tank and just all that kind of stuff. So uh, pulmonary rehab is really good about that. With um, the activity pacing, their morning activities are generally the hardest for a COPD patient because their secretions are always thickest and, and they're always worse in the morning because uh, those secretions tend to pool at night as the patient is asleep. So it's it's difficult for a COPD patient to really get up and get going in the morning. So you know that's something for you to remember as the nurse and then to also teach the patient that um, you know they might not want to plan a lot of activities first thing in the morning. They want to you know maybe give themselves time to get up, move around because they're going to be coughing a lot trying to clear those secretions. They might need uh, one or two breathing treatments to kind of get everything opened up, you know, and then let them plan their activities for midday or later in the day when they are really up and around. And Nursing management, these are our goals, is to um, achieve airway clearance. Again, a lot of mucus, a lot of decreased lung compliance. Um, constriction of airways, so we want to work with this patient to um, achieve airway clearance, improve their breathing patterns, reinforcing pursed lip breathing, encouraging them to slow down their respiratory rate, uh, improving activity to intolerance or activity tolerance through pacing of activities and rest, knowing their limitations. Uh, monitoring and preventing for complications. We, we, as nurses, that's our job. We really need to be on the ball and anticipate, especially in the hospital um, this semester, on step down. You know, these people are sick. If they're on step down, they're sick. So they have a higher potential to go into respiratory failure or develop an infection than a person who is at home, per se. 
we really need to push flu vaccines and pneumonia vaccines for these people. They are considered at high risk for the flu and pneumonia. So these vaccines are essential for these chronic conditions. Um, working with the patient to limit their triggers, reinforcing and encouraging turn cough and deep breathing with these people, controlled coughing, huff coughing to really get them to expectorate a lot of that mucus, CPT, postural drainage, these are all things that are very appropriate for patients with COPD, especially in an acute exacerbation where they have bronchoconstriction with increased mucus production. We need to really work with these patients for home care and help them identify community resources, uh, referral to pulmonary rehab as we talked about, maybe home health, uh, getting case management on board, really collaborating with other disciplines um, to get the patient situated so that they can have the best um, you know, quality of life that we can give them. Setting up home oxygen, helping the patient to know their own triggers, how to avoid the triggers. A lot of times heat and humidity can be a trigger. Um, so whatever it is that causes their bronchospasms, we need to help them identify it and teach them how to stay away from it. All right, asthma is a completely separate condition that we're going to talk about next, uh, chronic inflammatory disease of the airways that really um, it, it causes like a, an exaggerated response of the airway with edema and increased mucus. So instead of that, um, it's different from emphysema and COPD in that it's not that um, destruction per se of the alveoli and, and those air sacs, but it is, it is a disease of chronic inflam inflammation um, and a hyper responsiveness or hyper reactivity of the airway, which means it will bronchoconstrict very quickly. Um, edema, swelling, inflammation, and mucus. Okay. All of that leads to coughing, chest tightness, wheezing, dyspnea, those classic asthma signs. It is the most common childhood lung disease, um, but it can occur at any age. There are plenty of people who develop asthma as an adult. Allergies are the strongest predisposing factors, but um, actually asthma can, can develop in older teens or even older adults, uh, 30s, 40s, many times we will see asthma develop at, related to activity. It can be activity induced. Uh, I've also seen asthma develop as the result of GERD that has not been treated. Um, the patient has reflux and they actually um, they, I think the theory behind it is, is that there is just a slight amount of aspiration and it leads to lung irritation and inflammation and that triggers uh, GERD-induced asthma. The key difference between asthma and COPD is that asthma is reversible. Um, either it by, on its own spontaneously or um, it can be treated and reversed with medications. But that's the biggest difference, whereas COPD is not reversible. Um, asthma, that condition can be reversed and stopped. Airway narrowing, inflammation, bronchoconstriction, we talked about this. Um, the triggers, it's very important for the patient to know their triggers, whatever leads to that um, bronchoconstriction, increased mucus, the patient needs to be aware of that and, and avoid it at all costs. Three of the most common uh, manifestations with asthma 
is cough, dyspnea, and wheezing. Whereas our big three manifestations with COPD were cough, increased mucus production, and dyspnea with exertion. Okay? So with, with emphysema, COPD, it's chronic cough, increased mucus, dyspnea on exertion. With asthma, it's um, cough. Maybe not a chronic cough, but that uh, whenever the airway starts to tighten down, and close off, the patient begins to cough in an attempt to open the airway. Shortness of breath, not necessarily with exertion. Sometimes it's just at rest. And then that classic characteristic wheeze from the narrow, narrow airway. Um, it can happen very quickly, very abruptly. Or they can have kind of off and on symptoms over a period of time and then all of a sudden go into an acute asthma attack. But there are plenty of, of asthma attacks that happen that seemingly out of nowhere. Uh, of course, that dyspnea and bronchoconstriction can progress to hypoxemia and then eventual hypoxia with cyanosis. Uh, typically that hypoxemia responds very well to oxygen so we can put the patient on a uh, nasal cannula or a simple mask and typically they feel better. Their um, O2 sats come up very quickly and uh, if we can get a bronchodilator on board then we can really reverse that airway constriction and resolve that. So assessment findings, um, the patient's description of the symptoms that they feel, they will tell you that they feel tight. They can tell you that their chest is tight or they feel um, like they're not getting air good. Um, and they may not necessarily be short of breath, sometimes they are, but they'll, they'll tell you they'll feel tight and that they need a treatment. Uh, positive family history. It's very um, important to assess for a family history of asthma. Um, it is familial, so um, you know if mom has it, or brother has it, sister has it, you know then another sibling may have it as well. Um, environmental triggers have them report what have they been doing lately. A lot of times you'll see that. Maybe they were out cutting the grass or uh, weeding the flower beds or, you know, they went to the park. You know, you just want them to tell you, want them to report their uh, history, what they've been doing the last few days. Do they have any other comorbid conditions, GERD? Um, there can be medication-induced asthma, uh, specifically from beta blockers. If you remember in our cardiac lectures, we talked about Beta blockers are not cardioselective, and so they actually will block the beta receptors in the lungs as well and cause bronchoconstriction. So you need to look at their medication list and see what they're taking. And then in severe cases, severe attacks, an ABG is warranted to look at oxygen levels and acid-base balance. Medical management is going to be geared at pharmacologic treatment. Our fast-acting rescue inhalers and um, the long-acting or maintenance medications. Um, the quick relief medications are aimed at immediate symptom relief, immediate treatment. The short-acting ones are our beta-2 Adrenergic agonist, those are the smooth muscle relaxers. Um, there are some cautions with these medications, again with heart patients, um, because these are not, beta 2s are not, they're not specific to the lung, they're not specific, they're general type medications, um, they can have effects in the heart as well. So. Um, you know, those quick relief beta 2s are really good at bronchodilation, smooth muscle relaxation, okay? 
Anticholinergics also can be given for short acting or quick relief. They inhibit um, the vagal tone of the airway. So it, the, we use anticholinergics in patients who can't tolerate those beta uh, adrenergic drugs. So that kind of would be second line for patients who can't take the betas. But they, they, they kind of block beta, uh, bronchoconstriction. And then our third short-acting medication is IV or PO steroids. Okay? Typically, in, in, a, in a, an acute situation, it's going to be IV because we want to get a loading dose started and get that immediate effect. And then they'll put them on PO meds over a period of time. But we get that loading dose of IV solumedrol or solucortef, some kind of IV corticosteroid on board to reduce the inflammation. Now, they don't stop bronchoconstriction, but they do reduce inflammation. So we will a lot of times use IV corticosteroids in conjunction with the beta adrenergic um, via respiratory treatment. So a bronchodilator via inhalation, respiratory treatment, and then an IV corticosteroid for quick relief symptom management. Our long-acting medications um, typically are the inhaled corticosteroids. They're the most potent, they're the most effective to reduce inflammation and keep it reduced. So that's where the patient is going to be put on daily, um, either once a day or twice a day, inhaled steroid. Okay. Now IV steroids are quick relief and inhaled steroids are long-term, long-acting maintenance medicines. Those long-acting inhaled steroids, they have to be used every day. That inhaled um, or steroid inhaler, they have, the patient has to take it every day to maintain that anti-inflammatory action. Mast cell stabilizers will also be used to help control um, allergy attacks. Those are things like nasal crom, uh, those um, nasal inhaled medications to help reduce inflammation as well. Uh, those are, again, used for prophylaxis. Um, you cannot, a mast cell stabilizer is not going to be effective if the patient is already having an allergy attack. Mast cell stabilizers have to be used before that allergy exposure to prevent that response. So mast cell sta stabilizers and um, the inhaled corticosteroids are not effective in an acute asthma attack. Uh, Long-acting beta-adrenergic agonists can be used also along with our inhaled corticosteroids. So we're doing an inhaled bronchodilator and an inhaled steroid. Now there are plenty of combination um, medications out there that the patient can just do one puffer and they get both uh, a bronchodilator and a steroid via inhalation. Again, the long-acting beta adrenergic agonist, long-acting inhaled bronchodilators are not for acute asthma attacks. And then the third long-acting medication that you'll see given a lot are the leukotriene inhibitors. They, these block bronchoconstriction. They are um, used as an alternative to the inhaled corticosteroids. Uh, so if the patient has a you know, doesn't want to be on a steroid or they don't tolerate the steroids, um, you know, then these leukotriene inhibitors can be used instead. They don't necessarily decrease the inflammation the way a steroid will, but they do work to block bronchoconstriction and they can be very effective. Honestly, in reality, you're going to see all of these things combined. You're going to see the inhaled bronchodilators the inhaled steroids, and the leukotriene inhibitors, all three. Um, 
you're going to see them used in combination. And you're going to see these used not just with asthma patients, but in COPD patients as well. Um, none of the long-acting medications should be used in acute asthma attacks or acute exacerbations of COPD. If the patient needs quick symptom relief, then they've got to use a quick-acting medication. So you need to really do some teaching and um, make sure they understand the difference between their long-term maintenance inha inhalers and their rescue inhalers. Okay. Management of exacerbations is very important part of medical management. Um, you know, the patient needs to understand they need to get early treatment. They need to know what their triggers are. They need to know early symptoms to assess for. And they need to come into the doctor quickly. They don't need to stay home and try to take care of it themselves and then come in when they just absolutely can't breathe anymore. Okay? So we're trying to prevent an acute exacerbation of a chronic problem. We are not going to talk about peak flow monitoring, so just don't even worry about that. All right, so we've already talked about all of these drugs. Uh, review these tables on 626 and 627, and it kind of goes into the differences between these quick relief and long acting. Nursing management, our responsibility uh, as the nurse, it's we, you know, we have to take care of the patient. It all depends on the severity of their symptoms. If they are extremely symptomatic, then we need to be acting quickly. Okay, um, oxygen, emotional support, respiratory therapy, getting that bronchodilator on board, calling the doctor, sitting the patient up, getting them in a position of comfort. Thorough assessment, thorough respiratory assessment, listening to those lung sounds. Are they wheezing? Where are they wheezing? How severe is the wheezing? And if you remember from uh, health assessment, physical assessment in level one, if the patient is wheezing and they are very short of breath, dyspneic, and then all of a sudden they stop wheezing, that is not a good thing. If you haven't given a bronchodilator or any kind of medicine and they stop wheezing, that means that airway is completely closed and they are not moving any air. That patient will become very, very anxious. They will look at you with big eyes and they're going to be scared to death. Okay, So it, a thorough respiratory assessment is essential. Listen to front, back, top to bottom, all lungs, fields, all lobes, where are they wheezing, how profound, how loud is that wheezing, is it only heard with your stethoscope, is it audible without a stethoscope, you know, those are all very important clues. Administer the medications as ordered, um, emergent medications, call rapid response if you need to, if the patient is um, you know, very symptomatic, um, low oxygen saturations, you know, but get those bronchodilators on board. And then once that acute situation is over with, you know, do a lot of good teaching. Our, our nursing responsibility is to teach the patient about their disease process, about their triggers, the medications, um, how to handle increased sputum, good um, mucus Ex, uh, expectorating techniques, mucolytics, um, hydration, you know, short acting versus long acting medications, you know, all that stuff. Patient teaching is essential. So here are your patient teaching points. Um, proper inhalation techniques how to implement their action plan if they get into trouble, if they get into a, an acute situation where they are in crisis, um, how to remain calm and get help, 
and then when to go to the doctor. Okay, so these are review all of these teaching points. Okay, status as, as asthmaticus. This is um, a very severe extension of an asthma attack. It's actually when that asthma attack just persists and doesn't respond to bronchodilators uh, or anti-inflammatories, and we cannot break that, that cycle of bronchoconstriction. Typically, they, the patient will shift into status asthmaticus with very little warning and very quickly. Um, a lot of times it's triggered by that mucus plug. It's a, a progression from bronchoconstriction with a plug, you know, a mucus plug, which causes a complete obstruction of that um, airway. And then that leads to just, you know, no oxygen moving asphyxia, okay? Very labored breathing, prolonged uh, ex exhalation, expiratory phase, wheezing, you know, very typical, common, audible expiratory wheezes. Um, you know, a lot of times you don't even need a, a stethoscope to hear it. And again, if the wheezing disappears, that is actually a sign that the condition is worse and it's a sign of impending respiratory failure. Our assessment factors uh, would be just a very thorough respiratory assessment. We've already talked about that. Um, rate, depth, pattern, wheezing, where the wheezing is, what lobes, you know, uh, how profound, how loud is it. Diagnostic tests. Now, this is not in an acute situation. In a, if we're just in a stable situation, PFTs are going to be our most accurate diagnostic test because they're going to give us the real um, a very clear picture of lung function and how well that patient's lungs respond to bronchodilators. But if they are in an acute situation with status asthmaticus, then an ABG is going to be indicated because it can be done rapidly and it's going to tell us about acid base balance and ventilation perfusion mismatch. Okay, so um, in status asthmaticus, you're going to see a very um, significant shift in our ABG of um, poor oxygenation, hypoxemia with, you know, acidosis, retaining of CO2, okay? So with status asthmaticus, in that acute situation, we're not going to try to do a PFT. We're only going to go for ABG. And once we kind of get that asthma uh, crisis under control, then they can use the PFT as a diagnostic tool to evaluate the lung status and the response to bronchodilators. Medical management for status asthmaticus is just very close monitoring. How well are those treatments working? The first line, second line medications, the short acting beta 2s, corticosteroids, of course IV um, to decrease inflammation, um, first and second line medications, oxygen therapy, of course, to support the hypoxemia and prevent deterioration. And then, um, you know, the one thing we don't do is sedate these people because we want them to breathe. So, um, the thing about asthma is if we reverse the bronchoconstriction, once they get oxygen, then they calm down. It's not like the COPD patients that always feel like they're suffocating. With asthma, it's reversible. So if we reverse it, then they, they actually will calm down and they breathe better. If we sedate them, then we knock out that drive to breathe. So we don't sedate asthma patients, okay? Even uh, unless they go into respiratory failure, 
you know, if they go into acute respiratory failure and we need to intubate them, then of course they can be sedated. But prior to that point, we're, we're using our short-term, our short-acting medications to try to break that bronchoconstriction, reduce the inflammation, oxygen to um, counteract the dyspnea, cyanosis, and hypoxia. Nursing management, our responsibility, ongoing assessment of the airway and respiratory pattern, respiratory status, evaluation of the patient's response to these treatments. We're given the medicines, we're carrying out the, the ordered treatments, and then we're following up, we're evaluating, are these treatments working? Is the patient having a positive response? Is that wheezing getting better? Do they feel less short of breath? Um, you know, are their SATs getting better? Or are we given a treatment and it's not working and we need to call the doctor again? So just continuous evaluation, continuous assessment. We must anticipate um, what's going to happen if our treatments don't work. And ultimately, that is respiratory failure, which can lead to intubation. So you need to always anticipate, what am I going to do next? OK, I'm about to give this breathing treatment. If this doesn't work, what am I going to do next? What's my next line of action? Anticipation is key. Because if you wait until the treatment is finished and realize that the treatment didn't work, and then you start thinking about what to do next, you've wasted valuable time. Uh, energy conservation techniques are very important. That's part of our role as the nurse, is to encourage the patient to conserve their energy. Um, hydration to help lo uh, loosen secretions, limit exposure to their triggers, and then balance activities and rest group activities together so that um, they can accomplish a few things at a time and then sit down and rest and then go back later and finish. You know, just that balance to keep them from um, burning up too much energy. Okay, the last thing that we're going to talk about today is cystic fibrosis. It is a genetic disorder. It's the most common um, fatal autosomal, autosomal recessive disease among Caucasians. Um, it, um, it is a genetic problem, so it must be inherited. So, you know, both parents have to be um, carriers for the offspring to inherit the gene, okay? So the person has to inherit the gene from both parents before they will actually manifest the disease. Um, life expectancy today, that says 37 years, it has been extended actually. Um, you know, up to about 10 years ago, the life expectancy was only into the early teens, uh, maybe 20, because the treatments, people, they just died from complications of cystic fibrosis. But now we have much better medication and much better treatment. And so life expectancy for people with this disorder has really um, been lengthened quite a bit. But it is um, often a fatal genetic disorder. It's very important um, that genetic screening be done in um, families, you know, let's say one child is born with it uh, and it's an unknown, you know, the parents had no idea, then the parents need to have genetic screening and see, you know, what the situation is because um, if both parents are carriers, then it is likely that, that their offspring, all of their offspring will have the dis this disorder. So um, there's a lot of unknown carriers out there. So it's really important that, that patients have genetic testing done. Um, there are options for counseling for couples that are at risk for um, having a child with cystic fibrosis if they know they're a carrier. There's a lot of counseling available for them. 
so the, the pathophysiology behind it is um, a, a gene mutation that causes a thickened uh, viscous secretions in the lungs, but it's not just in the lungs. It can involve the pancreas, liver, GI tract, and the reproductive tract as well. So for some genetic reason, there's a, a, a mutation, and they just have an overabundance of very, very thick secretions, just copious amounts of mucus. Um, it also will increase um, salt content, so they will sweat their 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 sweat their excretions or their secretions. They'll be salty. They will actually excrete salt sometimes through their skin. So they just have this overabundance of very thick secretions. Um, and again, you know, average life expectancy is, is higher now. If both parents are carriers, then they have a one in four chance that the child will be born with cystic fibrosis. And it's not uncommon at all to see multiple children in a family that have it, um, you know, for, especially if the parents don't get screened. So there's a lot of teaching to be done there. Manifestations can be pulmonary or non-pulmonary in nature. The pulmonary symptoms are um, productive cough from all the secretions, wheezing, hyperinflation of the lungs, increased sputum production, chronic inflammation, many, many, many re recurrent respiratory infections. And that is just generally because of impaired mucus clearance. Um, you know, when I tell you they've got snot, they've got snot. They just can, you know, have a, a very hard time clearing all of the mucus. Uh, PFTs are going to show obstructive airway disease. Um, so they're going to show air, airway limitation or airway obstruction. They can have pancreatic insufficiencies, abdominal pain. GI problems, intestinal obstructions, um, vitamin deficiencies. Uh, often they will lose weight because of the secretions. You know, it's not just in the lungs, but it's in the pancreas and the liver and the GI tract as well. So they have, um, they can't absorb vitamins as well. They, they lose weight. They're like failure to thrive type. A lot of times these these people, the kids especially, they'll, they'll have really big hyperinflated chests and then their arms and legs will be very skinny. They look like a, a failure to thrive type child. Um, so they need vitamin replacement, nutritional supplementation, um, and they even will have problems with pancreatitis because of the pancreatic insufficiencies. Medical management, um, acute and chronic management, so we've got to treat infections and control exacerbations, um, and then focus on airway clearance. That is the primary goal of medical management. Um, the thick, increased, and very intense secretions will cause just many, many, many problems. So these, these patients are on daily regimen of CPT, postural drainage, and not just once a day, we're talking multiple times a day. They will have um, uh, high frequency chest wall oscillators. They actually, they have a vest now, an oscillator vest that these kids can put on, and, and it, they put it on just like a jacket, zips up, and then they can just sit and it's a high frequency oscillator and it, it just gives them that very high rapid CPT type of oscillating movement that will break up some of those secretions and help them um, get them out. Breathing treatments, mucolytics, hydration, of course increased protein, pancreatic enzymes and fat soluble vitamins because they have such pancreatic involvement that um, 
you know, they don't absorb their fat soluble vitamins. So they've got to have those replacements. They need increased caloric intake because they're burning so much energy and calories um, with the increased secretions trying to breathe. Nebulized mucolytics, bronchodilators, um, even will use NSAIDs sometimes to reduce inflammation. And then ultimately, end stage um, cystic fibrosis patients need to be evaluated for lung transplant. Um, that is an option for them, but it is a last resort. Okay. So again, this is a genetic problem, a genetic defect that leads to um, increased secretions, which can lead to pulmonary infections. They're prone to pneumonia and bronchitis. And, um, you know, if we don't handle the secretions, it can lead to um, respiratory failure. So airway management, airway clearance is the primary goal with postural drainage, CPT, and chest wall oscillators, and then all of the, the medications, inhaled nebulizers, bronchodilators, mucolytics, antibiotics for an, or, uh, infections, um, anti-inflammatories, you know, just all of those things to manage airway. All right, our nursing responsibility with these patients. Um, this is a team approach, okay? We have to really work together with not just um, nursing, but respiratory therapy, the doctor, dietary. Um, you know, we've really got to just come at this from all angles and then assist the patient and the family in learning how to manage all of this situation. Removal of secretions their risk factors for respiratory infection, reportable signs and symptoms, when to come to the doctor, you know, when, what's okay to handle at home and what needs to be reported, when to come to the hospital, signs of hypoxia, uh, poor perfusion, you know, they need to know about their medication regimen, they need to know about their um, hydration status and nutritional intake and supplementation. And then ultimately, a lot of psychosocial teaching, support, um, discussion about end of life issues because this is ultimately a fatal genetic disorder. And it's not necessarily the cystic fibrosis, you know, that mutation that kills them, but often it's either um, pancreatitis malnutrition or um, infection, pneumonia, something like that. They just, they get sick and they can't get over it. So there needs to be some real psychosocial support and end of life discussion um, with families. And especially if it's a family that has more than one child that is affected by this, then then we really have to focus on the psychosocial aspect of it and, and give them some real emotional support as they